This video is sponsored by War Thunder. Loud and clear. No time to lose, part timer. Radar scans are picking up green on your left side. Quota's at 475, so get moving. The uh, right door. The right door. Uh, it's real dark in here, control. Flashlight. I'll order some pro models once the quota rolls over. The Coilhead. Scientific name, Vercologeris. Their visual appearance is that of a bloody mannequin with a head connected by a spring. Their defining characteristic is their inability to move when in direct line of sight. Other visual quirks to note are the various nails driven into its body, which all have some form of dried blood around them. Despite being described as a mannequin, these wounds would imply some form of a biological interior, but nonetheless its exterior is evidently artificial as per these bestiary logs. The arms of this entity are also missing at the forearm, and its face appears to be stuck in a constant expression of what I can only describe as agony. Overall, it's a harrowing creature, and an ideal candidate to adapt into a realistic aesthetic. It also ranked highly in an impromptu community vote held last week. It's an ideal pick to start this one on. We're jumping right into it this time. I have collected some reference to work with during this process, but overall the Coilhead's anatomy is about one to one with a human. It's a mannequin, after all, an emulation of the average human body, albeit with some notable exceptions in the arms and neck in this case. I'd begin with blocking out the base shape of the character, and just like the employee uniform I put together previously, I'm using subdivision surfaces. This is a mesh modifier that affects a model, dividing the polygons of the model and smoothing them out to give the end result a more graphically polished appearance. This way, I can create the base using more simple block-based shapes and adjust it more easily as I go, as opposed to working with a denser mesh with more polygons, which lends itself to a messier and overall less reliable experience when creating a base to build upon. Some alterations to the coil head that differentiate it from a standard human mannequin are of course the coil sections and the missing arms themselves. But there's also some other design choices here that I noticed in the game's model. First of all, the neck and surrounding shapes leading into the collarbone are much wider than would be present on a normal human. This also includes the back muscles, which are far bulkier than would be expected for someone of this size. Either this implies that the coil head is far more muscular than initially seemed, or more likely, these are design choices made to accommodate for the character's iconic spring neck, which when wobbling around can take up a bit of space around it. Or, if you want to get more technical about it, may have an incredibly unstable center of gravity that would require heavy musculature around the collarbone area just to accommodate for a head that swings around very erratically and suddenly. But that's just a theory. Creating the coil itself is a different ordeal, 
Blender actually has a mesh modifier called a screw for this exact kind of purpose. Given a flat profile to work with, this modifier will stretch out the mesh into a helix shape. Using a circular profile, we can use this modifier to produce what believably looks like a spring coil, and we just need to adjust it to fit between the body and the head. With a basic blocked out shape of the coil head, it's time to model some nails to stick into this thing. To do that, I'm just using a primitive cylinder shape and extruding it out on one end to make the head of the nail, while deleting the faces on the other side of the nail that would just be inside the body of the coil head. No use modeling the point of a nail if it's out of sight, otherwise it's just unnecessary processing power being used. ZBrush is our ideal digital sculpting program, and the place where we'll be defining the shapes of the coil head's body further. Specifically, I'm sculpting in the muscle details of the coil head, both to define the shapes itself from the more simplistic previous blockout model, and to give it some anatomical believability. The general mantra when workshopping these designs like this is to exaggerate as much of it as you can before toning it back. That way you can explore the full spectrum of what you're working on and see what looks good and what just doesn't. For this reason, the coil head is going to look jacked for a little bit, but eventually I pull it back, thinning out the shapes a bit more to reach that standard mannequin look the original has. Importing the nail models in as a visual aid, I can use it to guide the placement of the holes on the body along with some displaced flesh around the edges. This way it looks more like something has been driven in rather than just being a cylinder stuck onto the side of some guy. The final part of this sculpting phase, and the one I was most excited for, was the head. The coil head. It appears like a warped human face, and naturally that meant I had to begin defining the coil head's journey with a normal human face, which I could then deform after the fact. This meant a lot of drawing in the main shapes of the skull, like the chin, cheekbones, and brow. Places that define the overall flow of the rest of the face. Once I had a basic enough face, it was time to pull and morph it around to fit closer to the appearance of the original coil head model, sculpting in folds and bumps when necessary to give it a more believable look. The obvious part of this is the gaping toothless maw of this entity, but it also includes the slant of the eyes and face, with one side hanging a little bit lower than the other. It's this unevenness that gives the coil head an uncanny appearance. While most things in nature aren't absolutely symmetrical, there's still some aspect of mirrored biology in most life. So when something has this much of an asymmetrical, almost melted look, it clocks in our brains as something wrong. Something uncanny. Retopology. The process of recreating a model's faces with simpler geometry to reduce processing requirements and provide a more streamlined mesh to work with. In this case, our detailed model and our initial blockout model actually hold a close enough resemblance to each other that we can get away with using a shrink wrap modifier on the body to align it with the newer version more closely. As a refresher, modifiers are something that can be added to a model to give it a specific effect without affecting its polygons directly up until the modifiers are applied, meaning they are set into the model and their effects are now reflected on the polygons themselves. In this case, the shrink wrap modifier will make its affected mesh wrap itself over a chosen target model. In our case, we're placing a shrink wrap modifier onto our simpler blockout model and setting the target to our new sculpted version. This won't increase its polygon count or anything like that, but it will match the shapes more closely together, which will help us when baking detailed textures later down the line. When it comes to the head, things get a bit more complicated. It's generally the same retopology process I had when I did the bracken. I could get away with using shrink wraps to do the body, but the head's geometry is far too removed from the first blockouts to feasibly do it this way. So instead, I'm manually marking out the faces and creating a one-to-one -one recreation with a lower amount of polygon faces. Thankfully, unlike the bracken, I can retain the shrink wrap modifier on the body in this case, because the body and the head are separate objects. That being said, the modifiers will still need to be applied to the model so that I can go in and mark the seams for UV unwrapping. If you've seen my previous Lethal Company models, you'll know that the gist of UV mapping is to mark a seam line where the model will be opened up from and flattened out so we can paint textures onto them. This is our next step, and we're making good time. Substance Painter is our texturing program of choice, and it's here that I use the higher detail sculpted version of the coil head as the input for baking in detailed texture sets that will become applied to the lower polygon model we have loaded in Substance Painter. 
I've gone over the whole process of baking twice over in my previous video, so I'm not going to elaborate on it again here much further, but now our more optimized model looks like our higher detail one. And before we go neck deep into the texturing phase here, I just want to say that I hope you appreciate the effort to try and stay true to the original vision here. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need a break. It's time to hop on my favorite vehicle combat game, War Thunder. Free on PC and consoles, you can take control of 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships, and find yourself among the worldwide community 70 million strong. You pick what you play, from 1920s era biplanes to modern day fighter jets. The game's graphics and sound effects really make it feel like you're operating a machine of war. The game has so much to explore, and it caters well to realism, with everything accounted for. When a vehicle gets destroyed, you can see what caused it through these impressively detailed x-ray views. And the game has three separate modes, each one ramping up in their realism. Arcade and Simulator are fast-paced and hardcore respectively, while realistic is a good balance between the two. You can also customize with camouflage, decals, and decorators, even community created ones, which is huge for creators in the space. The game runs great even on lower end machines with its own in house engine. No extra hardware needed either. Even with the vehicle simulators, all you need is your mouse and keyboard or a controller. I have a link in the description when you choose to play the game. You'll get the Eagle of Valor vehicle decorator, 100,000 silver lions, and a week of premium no matter what platform you're on. Do it before the end of January, and you also get three festive Gaijin snail decals. It's for a limited time though, so be quick with it. And now back to discussing the texturing phase of our coil head model. Right off the bat, I'm using the built-in Smart Material Substance Painter comes with to place the metal materials over the spring coil and the nails. Using the edge details of our baked texture sets to place the wear and roughness on the metal depending on its surface. I'm fairly sure these are nails, but I went ahead and used some normal map stamps Substance Painter gives you to place screw top crosses on the heads of the nails, making them look more akin to screws than nails. It's a bit inconsistent, but these could also be bolts, we're not really given a direct answer about this. For the actual base of the body itself, I placed the base skin tone over all of it, with a blackness layer painted in on the eyes and mouth to give it that empty husk look the original character has. This is closely followed up with some dark red metallic colouring using special brushes to give it the appearance of blood stains around the nails and other parts of the body corresponding to the textures of the original character textures. Some height layered in on a procedurally generated texture, and some ridges painted into the arms and legs give it that mannequin look, appearing like worn stone or plaster with the segmented limbs a mannequin would have, which also further justified the disconnected head from a design standpoint. Substance Painter has smart masks, similar to smart materials, but rather than housing a full material set to apply to a model, it just affects the masking of a given layer. With this, I made a slightly less shiny dark brown layer with a dirt smart mask over it, layering these in until the model looked sufficiently worn, without going too overboard. It's here that we can move back into Blender for our final steps with the coil head. Blender's Rigify add-on comes with its own pre-packed skeleton rigs, used for making a model move once it's had parts of its model assigned to each bone. I deleted part of the skeleton rig to accommodate the coil head's anatomy, and with some of Blender's automatic rigging features paired with some manual adjustment from myself, I was able to come out with a coil head model that looks about done and free to wonder. Here, take a look. the E9 doors. I've still got two objects reading down that way, did you? Oh no, wait, no, no. Close the doors! <sighs> Copy. So, no luck? Gonna take that as a yes? 
I've got nothing in the immediate sector. I'll need you to do some walking. Uh, take the center door. Hey, Control, I think I got something. Yeah, I saw it on the scans. What do you see? Looks like some sort of kid's toy? Like like one of those wind-up uh, the jack-in-the-box. Hmm, not a prime piece of scrap, but the sun's getting low. Grab it and go. <laughs> what? Uh, control, control this thing, it's alive, it's, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Don't care. What? We're well, riding the edge of our deadline here, and we have no scrap to show for it. Grab it and go. Did, did you hear anything I just said? The company pays well for Xenos, just keep the box closed and get back to the ship. No, you don't, no, you don't understand, it, it has arms and legs. Most animals have arms and legs. No, this, this isn't an animal, it looks like people. What do you mean it looks like people? I'm leaving, I'm not doing this. Oh, wait, 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 scan its bio signal. Are you, are you serious? Just a quick one. This thing is a data into the archive, I can trace it back. Out of there before it goes ape. You can't hide from it, just evacuate. There's no freaking scientific record. Good luck. You know just as much as us. We just call it the Jester. That was the actual in game bestiary entry for this thing. The Jester. Scientific name Insanius Thingus. This entity resembles a classic jack-in-the-box wind-up toy, with holes cut out in the bottom for legs to walk around on, and a hole in the side for an arm to wind up its own crank. Upon winding, a rendition of Pop Goes the Weasel begins, and on completion an elongated growth of flesh emerges, with a skull on top used for chewing up unfortunate passers-by. There are three obvious references to pull from here, and that's where we'll start with this character. Its limbs are outright human in appearance, its body is that of a real-world jack-in-the-box, and its head is that of a skull, albeit with some subtle differences. Depending on who you ask and how nice you are, this might be cheating, but in a lot of professional contexts when working on a character, a 3D artist doesn't have the time to create a human base model every single time just for each character, so it's actually standard practice to have a base model ready that you can use as a starting point for all kinds of characters depending on how they look. In this case, I'm gonna pull the legs I created for the coil head, specifically the ones we made during the blockout phase, to act as the jester's legs. We'll still be sculpting over these in ZBrush later when doing the higher detail sculpt, but for a starting point, it's more logical to use this rather than make a whole new leg in the same video. It's after this that I'm just shaping out the main box shape. Considering that it's built the way it is, this is a somewhat simple process of cutting holes in the faces or otherwise aligning it all up to look the way we want. I also included some other detail aspects here, like the hinges of the lid that I created by adjusting the shapes of cylinders and elongating one end to make the plate of the hinge that attaches to each side. Just like the coil head legs, I actually went back to the old bracken model from when I was initially blocking out that model, and pulled the arm from there, making it a bit more gangly and making it just work better for this character's design. The crank was simple enough too. 
A cylinder with some indents for the base of the handle with a subdivided cube extended out into the shape of the crank, and with a rounded off cylinder at the end for the grip of the handle. Simple stuff. One thing that was deceptively unsimple was the base itself. Using a subdivided cube with some holes cut into it didn't quite work how I wanted. It pulled all of the polygons generated from the subdivision modifier towards the hole and created this weird topology that overlapped the hole slightly and just was not viable. Eventually placing a cylinder over the holes and inverting the faces outwards to form the square shape seemed to do the trick. Looking at the growth that connects the base box body to the skull of the jester, there are some parts of it that make me believe this is meant to be a brain and accompanying stem. If you see up here, this big growth at the top takes up the inside of the skull and seems to have a more wide oval shape compared to the rest of it. Not to mention the texture has the seam at the back that looks an awful lot like the cerebral fissure, otherwise known as that seam in the brain that separates the left and right halves. So that was the direction I planned to take it. Modeling this brain was just a matter of extruding a subdivided cube up and into the rough shape, fitting in some tendrils around it like it has in the original game model. With the tendrils, I'm just making these out of bezier curves, which are a little bit different from a normal type of mesh. Like the screw modifier from earlier, when making the spring coil for the coil head, bezier curves use a profile to create their surfaces. By default, this is a circular one, and this works just fine for our purposes, since we want a rounded tube. Rather than having defined points from each end, the shape in between these two points on the curve are interpolated, meaning that Blender is mathematically predicting how the geometry between each end curves and winds to meet each end. For our purposes, we'll just be using these to make sinewy stretches of flesh from the base to the brain. On to the fun part, the skull. My initial approach was to try and model the whole skull using flat plane surfaces, paired with subdivision modifiers to shape it out, but it wasn't long before I realised I just didn't have enough geometry to work with and it just wouldn't be as practical to do it this way as I expected it to be. So, instead I just shaped out a basic skull shape without the holes, just a faceplate and a jaw. And then I moved into ZBrush, where I was going to do the rest of it. Here, I just marked out the eye sockets and nose holes, going back in the blender briefly to model up some teeth for the skull made out of subdivided rounded out cubes. A quick aside should be made here to note that the teeth on the jester's skull are both much smaller and much more numerous than normal human teeth, and the overall facial structure of the skull is just a little bit wider than a normal human's would be, which actually contributes a subtle uncanniness to its look that I don't think is easy to notice. Reference is king here, and my main direction for shaping out this skull and following the major shapes and silhouette of a real world skull, using images of the in-game gesture to adjust overall proportion to match more closely with it as I go. With the skull out of the way, it's time to sculpt in some of the muscles on the arms and legs, just to define them a bit better and give them a more anatomical realism, and of course, the brain and stem. The stem itself is mostly just lines and sinew, leading down alongside the tendrils that flow down, so most of the work here is on the brain. I don't know how brain's wrinkles are distributed by heart, so I'm heavily relying on reference here to show me where to place these creases. I started off keeping it symmetrical so I could sculpt in these wrinkles on one end and have it mirror onto the other end, but once it looked good enough, I pulled out the shape to more closely match the original game model and hang a bit of the brain out of one of the eye sockets, just like the in-game character seems to have as far as I could see from in-game screenshots. With this part of the model done, it was time to move back to Blender for... Once again, it's read topology time. Most of this work actually goes into the skull itself again, since the one I did in ZBrush doesn't quite have the cleanest topology, especially on its interior. So here we are, using flat surfaces placed over the surface of the skull to recreate, i.e. re-topologize its surface, paired with subdivision and shrink wrap modifiers to make the end result better. Once it was shaped out, I placed a solidify modifier over it as well, which gives the flat planes a thickness to it so that it doesn't look like a flat papercraft creation, but a hollowed out skull with a bit of thickness to it. The arms and legs are a simple process of shrink wrapping the original base mesh version to fit closer to the sculpted versions, although there isn't much difference here either way, considering how close they are to each other in silhouette. As for the brain stem, given a lot of its details are in its wrinkles and creases, a simple subdivided and extruded cube is enough to cover its shapes quite well, and we can shrink wrap our bezier curves from earlier to fit into the ones we did in ZBrush. No manual retopology required. 
After this, it's all a matter of renaming the parts of the models into different suffixes of underscore low and underscore high for texture baking and substance painter, as well as using things like subdivision modifiers and beveling to give the underscore high versions of the model that haven't already been given a high definition sculpt some perceived higher detail and subtle rounding off of edges so that we aren't left with absolute 90 degree hard edges which don't really exist in the real world. Everything has some kind of roundness to its edge, no matter how thin. And now we're up to UV mapping. Same as the coil head, we mark out the seams and unwrap the model so it's laid flat over our texture space and packed tightly together, to get as much coverage as possible, where we can then paint over it in Substance Painter. Firstly, we bake our high detail version of our model onto our lower detail version, and we can begin. Starting off with the base of the jester, the jack-in-the-box part of it, I just coloured it in with a red base and placed a lightly coloured layer over it masked with one of Substance Painter's procedural textures that I found to be strikingly similar to the one used in the game. From there it's just a matter of marking out which parts of the model have that purple rim to it, and placing the yellow circles on each side where the printed images go. Just like the coil head, I used a metal smart material for the handle of the crank and some of the interior of the box as a quick solution and coloured in the limbs with a white layer. I then layered a red colour over the limbs with the thickness maps created during the texture baking process. And this is just acting as a mask to simulate blood flow in the flesh, with the thinner points of the body generally appearing more red with blood flow and being more translucent. This was topped off with a slightly lighter colour that also has some height value to it to create some basic toe and fingernails. Moving on to the fleshy portions, I used a red coloured base and overlaid some darker textures as a mask, colouring in lighter portions closer to the top of the brain and the slightly more exposed sections of the mass, just as it appeared in the original character's texture. It may just be the exposed sections are drier or more exposed to light, but that's just speculation on my part. And now the skull! Looking at the original, it looks to be a bit of a dark tinge of yellowy green, something I attribute to being stored in the fleshy box prison in a basement for an undisclosed amount of time. And I just painted over that with some dirt brushes to give it the wear you see on the character, as well as some splotches here and there for corresponding blood stains. No secrets to how those got there, this thing bites. Going back to the base of the Jester for a moment, I decided to pull the actual printed images from the original Jester's textures and crop them into their own separate images I could import into Substance Painter and stamp onto the circles I'd marked out on the model. It worked surprisingly well and I'm actually quite happy with it, so I moved on to doing some more subtle detailing. This began with overlaying some darker and lighter smart masks, just like I'd done previously with the dirt imperfections on the coil head, to give it that look of old wear, so that it didn't just appear as a pristine object and instead reflected the fact that this thing is in a bunker somewhere. I also used a built-in tool Substance Painter has, the screw tool, separate from the uh, blender screw modifier, this is a different thing. This one allows me to place bolt heads onto the texture with built-in colour, metallic, and height layers to quickly simulate the appearance of a screw having been drilled into its surface. I used this in some of the corners of places to make it appear as if the structure of the box had been bolted together, and I also used some height-adjusted layering on the lid to give it some indentations, as well as on the rim of the side circles to make it look like a part of the box and not just a sticker slapped on the side. And once again, it's time to rig. Just like before, I'm using a Rigify skeleton with parts deleted and adjusted to fit its new body, and the arms and legs worked quite nicely with the automatic rigging, but the base box, crank, and contained brain and skull all needed to be done manually. This was just a matter of going in and selecting a bone, and then selecting the faces of the mesh I want to be affected by that bone, and assigning them. This was a rinse and repeat process for the rest of these bones, but eventually I do have a jester, capable of moving and cranking it. Here it is, in all of its glory. Here's the pair of them together as well. Big thanks to those of you who stuck through to the end. I was a bit worried that people wouldn't want me to keep doing these things from Lethal Company, but it seems like people actually want more, which is pretty sweet considering it's a game I find really interesting to explore. Seriously good job from the dev, and if you came along from start to finish, or just skipped through to the end, thanks for checking it out. I definitely am still looking for more ideas on these, so if you have a particular creature you want to see from the game, just give it a shout in the comments or something and I'll see how everyone's feeling about it. But seriously, thanks again everyone.
Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. As a reminder, you can play for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox with my link in the pinned comment and video description. Whether you're new or haven't played the game in 6 months, you'll still get the bonus pack containing premium vehicles and other content. That also includes the limited time festive Gaijin snail decals if you do it before the end of January. Don't miss it.